Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Barbara Bolden, based out of Atlanta, flew up here to share with us today the evolution of technology. And really, over the years, we've done so many different things in tech. She started her career working in Bell Labs. Who here remembers Bell Labs? That's really cool. So Bell Labs helped create things like, I don't know, Unix, right? <laughs> the thing that later evolved and helped influence Linux, which runs many of the things we do today, our phones, the internet, right? Well, Barbara worked at Bell Labs, and during her time and in her career, she's worked at many different organizations helping with technology innovation. And she's going to share her experience with us today. I'm really excited to learn from Barbara and the evolution of technology. Big hand, welcome Barbara to the stage. Okay, so he told a little bit of my story. I got out of college and I had a degree in mathematics and computer science and I got recruited by Bell Labs and this is the funny part of it. I was given a choice by HR. I could work in one of two organizations and one organization was big and they had some really interesting stuff going on and they had clubs for after work. They had a bridge club, they had a stock club, they had a ski club. And the other organization, they were, it was smaller and they had older guys and they had these thick, gla thick glasses and guess what they were working on? They were working on Unix. Now, I never heard of Unix, so I said, oh no, I'm gonna go with the other organization because they, they have this cool stuff that I heard of and they have a ski club. So this was one of the best decisions of my technical career. But it was really cool technology. We worked on online systems that they predicted were gonna come soon. And we worked on microprocessors and it was a very good job. Now, it was strange being a woman there. They had 5,000 men, 300 women. I would be asked to pass the coffee pass the cookies, get the coffee. But the weird thing was, I didn't even think that was unusual. In that day and age, I kind of expected that. So anyway, I wanted to get promoted, and I didn't. The guy I shared the office with, he got promoted. But anyway, that was what happened. Now, I was young, and I wanted to start a family. I got pregnant. In those days, when you got pregnant and you started a show, you left. So I left, there was no maternity leave, so you had to quit. Now, when it was time for me to come back to work, they had a job freeze, so I couldn't go back to Bell Labs. So I went to AT&T. So I came back to work, and nothing changed, except there was a little something going on called divestiture. So things were pretty crazy. We used to have one company, now there was nine companies, they had six regional telephone companies where we had all what we used to fondly call the baby bells. And um, they had three companies for the, one was a consumer, one was for business, and one was what they called long lines, which was the network. I was in the business part. So since they were basically trying to figure out how to handle all this, we had a lot of reorganizations. And whenever they would reorg, they would move our cubicles. We would have to go to different cubicles because they had to have different space, they had to have different territories. And we would move our stuff. Now, nothing was online, so we had like this pile of manuals to work out of. So we would put our manuals on our chairs and we would be like wheeling them around like little mice with their their little nuggets or whatever. And so this went on for about 18 months. And this is absolutely true, I swear. Once I absolutely wound up in the same cubicle I had had before. 
what would be the odds. But you know what? It was actually a really good place to work for a software engineer, because I got to work on so many projects and never would have had those opportunities in a normal environment. So one of them was the customer record database for AT&T. Now, this is a big deal. But what they had done, which if you know anything about database design, is not a good thing to do. They made the key telephone number. So you're never supposed to have your key be intelligent. But what was even worse was they had no control over the telephone company. The telephone companies had control over the telephone numbers. So one day, one of the guys on the team comes rushing in and he's all upset and we go like, what's the matter? And he said, they're adding a new area code. So we have like mass panic. So we worked like, you know, for three days straight, 24 hours, got it solved. But I think we learned not to make our database keys intelligent and not to base them on anything we had no control over. So that was one incident. Another thing that was kind of interesting was that I would always be sort of unusual. So I, this time I was on the order processing system and I went to my team leader and I said, you know what, I would really like to see what this, this system looks like to the end user. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I think I could write a better code if I had some idea of what this looked like in context. And he's like, confused look, and he goes, get back in your cubicle and do your work. So that didn't happen. But what I did do is, on another application that was consumer oriented, I got the bright idea. I thought, oh, I'll call the AT&T store and I'll pretend I'm a customer. So I did that and then I really did get a view of what the system looks like to the customer, which in this day and age, that's like incredibly hard for us to understand <laughs> that you know we wouldn't want the application programmers to not know what the system looks like. But anyway, so, I had a boss once that was kind of like rogue too. So he says to me, I'm going to send you over to Bell Labs because they won't talk to us because they don't think we're smart. But you used to work there, so I think they'll talk to you. So he sends me over to Bell Labs and they, they did. They're like really nice to me and they're showing me all around and they're showing me what they're working on. And I come across this project and it was a collaboration system. This is in the 80s, and it was like the real deal. I mean, they had screen sharing, they had messaging, they could see each other on the screen. I mean, it was incredible. And I'm like, what are you doing with this? And they're like, oh, you know, we keep working on it. We think it's pretty cool. And I'm like, have you shown it to anyone? And they said, yeah, we showed it to DuPont. And I said, well, what do they think? And they said, well, they were interested in it. And I'm like, well, <laughs> what happened? And they said, well, we didn't want to really necessarily support it, or we might have to add things if they wanted things. And I'm thinking, this is not a problem. <laughs> so I go back to my boss and I tell him about this, and he's really excited. And we try to get something going, and we had people interested, but we couldn't make it happen. Because what AT&T was like then is they had all these people that had been used to working in a regulated environment, and like the whole structure and all the rules was for regulated, and they were really trying to make it entrepreneurial and get a new set of processes and rules and mindset, but it hadn't really gelled all the way yet. So that was kind of unfortunate. And I wanted to get promoted, and I wasn't getting promoted. but. I did hit the jackpot. So what happened was they came out with automation for software development. And I was so excited. I can't even tell you how excited I was. And the timing was good because the situation for IT was not rosy. The, um, the managers were starting already to get concerned I'm sorry, my throat's a little dry, so if I sound funny, I apologize. <clears throat> um, the managers were already starting to get alarmed. There was so much legacy programs. 
the executives were starting to notice the IT budget. And the programmers themselves were like, we're kind of tired of being woken up in the middle of the night because operations can't understand our run books. You all know what run books are. Yeah, yeah, no, yes? Okay, good. Anyway, so I was able to convince my district manager to buy some of these tools. So I thought, this is great. We're gonna use these tools. Everything's gonna get better. Everyone's gonna want it. It's gonna be a piece of cake. Not so much. What do you think happened? Everybody was like, I'm busy. I don't wanna hear it. It doesn't fit in with what I'm doing. Go away. Not today. Why are you bothering me? I'm sure everybody here has heard their own version of this. This is a typical kind of drum that we all face with the culture thing. So I figured out I had a culture problem on my hands. But I did, oh, thank you. I did um, enlist the help of a couple of people and we put together a plan to set about and effect a cultural change. And that story is a whole other presentation. So I'm not gonna go through that, but I did write a book about it. And it is on Kindle, a little plug here. You can buy it. It's outdated, but I think if you read it, you would recognize yourself and recognize the situation. And um, one thing I wanna share from it, excuse me, is that I set up the proverbial stakeholder team and I invited all the usual suspects, end users, product owners, architects. But I got this bright idea. I thought maybe there's one group that nobody really considers. It might be a good idea to include and I invited operations. So there you have it. I was thinking DevOps then. Um, so I was having all the success, but I still wasn't getting promoted. Nothing changed. And what happened next was there was a communication worker strike. So they sent all the guys out in the field because we were considered management to do all the jobs. So they were riding around in forklifts and being on all those, I don't know the names, but the things that fix the telephone. Cherry picker, thank you. Um, and my husband worked in the same district, so he was out in Michigan, we lived in New Jersey. So one day, the district manager, who was a, had a good old boy buddy system friendship going with my husband, came over to my desk and he says, hey Barbara, I was talking to your husband last night and he, and I said to him, you better be calling Barbara all the time or she's gonna be running around here with bright red lipstick and no bra. And I could not believe my ears. I mean, here I am, I'm a software engineer. I had gotten this whole organization, not a small one, to use these automated tools, written a book, and he is talking to me like I belong to my husband, like I'm a sex object. So I thought, I'm not getting promoted, I'm being talked to like this, it might be time to leave. So I head on out to the Silicon Valley, I go west. And now I am working on the business side of the industry. So I'm doing all these software deals, I'm doing acquisitions, I'm doing resale deals. I'm like big girl, I'm working with the big boys. So uh, some of the stories that I'll share are just, there's a ton of them, but a couple that are interesting is I was at a meeting at Intel and there was probably 20, 25 vendors there. And Intel has this big PowerPoint and they're laying out this big program and they have like this whole 12 point plan. And the gist of it is they wanna take down Microsoft. And I'm like, yeah, that worked out well. <laughs> and then another time, one of the guys that works for me, he comes running into my office and he goes, I got this guy on the phone and he's putting together these components and building computers, and he wants a copy of our product, see if he can get it to work on his computer. And I'm like, who is this? 
and he said, Michael Dell. And I'm like, oh, I met him. He sounds like a guy that's going places. Give him a copy of our product. So I'm thinking, okay, this makes up for the Unix debacle, a little bit at least. Um, and then I worked for this guy that was a definitely an eccentric genius. And I think to build a product that is a success in the Silicon Valley, you've got to be eccentric. Now this guy was from the UK and we would have meetings there and he had this thousand year old house, I'm not exaggerating, and it was like a big rectangle and it was, had a great hall, which if you don't know, has a hollow center and all the rooms are like around it. And in the center of this, in the Great Hall, he has this giant trampoline. <laughs> and they had this great big fireplace. And in the fireplace, he always had a fire. Like in July, there would be a fire. And he would have this thing where whenever we were meeting with another vendor, they had to come to him. He would not go to them. Now, this is in the 90s. And if you're going to demo your product in the 90s, you're not bringing a laptop top and a thumb drive. You're coming with like, you know, carts of equipment. This was no small feat. So, oh, and he had these giant sheepdogs, these huge sheepdogs. They were like filthy and they would be like jumping on the tables and getting mud all over and throwing the contracts around. It was like, you know, a zoo. So, one day, we're gonna have this meeting with these guys from Belgium. He wanted to add sound to the product. So we're all waiting. It's like, you know, like 15 people waiting around for three, four hours. He's not anywhere to be seen. Finally, he shows up in this helicopter which lands on his lawn. Gets out of the helicopter, hands me two bottles of, you know, I don't know, $200 wine, whatever it was, and says, all right, go in the library with these guys and don't come out till you have a deal. These guys like barely spoke English and I certainly didn't speak German, French, whatever it was. So we were in there for a long time, but we did strike a deal. So we come out, we all have champagne, everyone's happy. Now, the thing of that job was, I was making these deals where they would expect to pay 10 million and the company I worked for was the, co the company I worked for was expecting to pay 10 million and the vendor was expecting like at least 100 million. So somehow I had to make these deals happen. And I usually did, but I couldn't get promoted. Even though I'm working with CEOs, I'm still a manager. So I figured the only way I am getting promoted, I am breaking through that glass ceiling is to start my own company which is exactly what I did. But before I left, I do just want to share a dark side of the Silicon Valley, besides not getting promoted. But, and you all know that, you've all heard the Google debacle, but there was a lot of sexual harassment. And like one night I was having dinner with this guy and a vendor, and I think we're having a business meeting. He thinks that we're having a date. And at the end of the dinner, he says to me, I'm married, I'm not getting a divorce, but I really like to sleep with you. And I'm like, does this ever work? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, three out of five times. And I go, well, you've hit two out of five. So, I mean, that was kind of the flavor of what went on. I want to see how I'm doing time-wise. Um, and then another thing, there was subtle stuff too, like unconscious stuff. Like I'd be, on, we'd have these worldwide conference calls that lasted six hours, and I was on one that was Mother's Day. I'm the only woman on the call. And after this four-hour call, the CEO says, guys, I just want to thank you for being on this call and taking this time away from your wives and mothers. And I'm like, dude, the mother's on the call, you know? And not a word. And you know, he didn't mean that to be mean or anything. It's just like, let's think a little. 
But anyway, okay, so going back to starting my own company. Okay, so I headed back east. We bought 40 acres in West Virginia. We're doing it on our own, so we're really scrapping around. We're eating ramen noodles, we're living on credit cards. It was rough. In fact, we made friends with the people next door that had a farm, and they had some extra steak that they got from an old cat they killed. And I want to tell you, you know, this is me, right? It's not ramen noodles. But we literally had to stew that thing three days. So, um, but we were able to build a product that, you know, I thought was pretty awesome. I mean, this is like, you know, more than 15 years ago. And what it did was it took a slice of a relational database, perfect slice, and it and it was Oracle SQL Server, we were working on DB2, and it dished it up to the internet, and a user could do whatever they wanted with it, and we used XML. So we're using SQL, XML, and I know that doesn't probably sound like much now, but in those days, that was, you know, big deal stuff. So we now need money, because we gotta sell this, we gotta market it, so, we go out to get venture capital. Now, I know it's hard for women to get venture capital now, but it was really hard then. But we did it. We got three rounds of venture capital, 12 million. And, you know, I didn't think there was that much overt sexual problems there. Um, there was some subtle stuff, like I went to visit a venture capital guy, and he said, I really wanted to meet the woman who got this far, okay? And the venture capital guys we had, they had a whole series of CEOs that they had invested in, and they would introduce them to Fortune 500 companies to help them sell, and we never got an introduction. So that was kind of there. And, but we had a really good run. We had some good customers. We had First Fidelity. We had U.S. Treasury, um, ADP. And then the dot-com bubble burst, and we bit the dust. So at this point, I'm kind of tired. I need a sabbatical. So I went and taught high school math for a while. And then my daughter, Karen Lawton, I call her the serial entrepreneur because she helped me start InfoShark, had started SG Technologies, which does consulting services and workshops for DevOps and DevSecOps. And she had started this company and she recruited me. And I went back into this business, and I'm working on DevOps and DevSecOps, and I love it. I really love it. I work with John Willis. I, I want to say that this community is very welcoming, and I enjoy working with you. And I'm just really encouraged at the atmosphere of inclusiveness I see. All right, has anything changed? Well, I mean, I look around the room. I don't see a lot of women, so that makes me sad. Um, I recently heard that the numbers are going down. That makes me sad. Um, but I wanted to share something. I was giving this presentation and afterwards some gentleman said to me, my daughter is really interested in computers and math and I feel nervous about encouraging her. I don't want to put her into a hostile work environment. What are your thoughts? And I said, well, if I had it to do all over again, I would not hesitate for a minute. So I think that is hopeful. And I would really love to hear people's thoughts. And if you email me, I promise I will return your email. And I want to say thank you. And these are my three amigos. That's it.